Okay, it's 8.30, so let's go ahead and get started today. And right, so good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? We're on week four of the uh, of the semester. Hopefully everyone's doing good. It's cooling down finally. It, it actually feels like it's cooler, although the wildfires are uh, kind of scary. All right. Um, so the uh, so the plan for today is we're going to finish up the, the very last section of our fluid statics notes. So that's just the the part on uh, buoyancy and flotation. So um, I know we kind of had a, a really uh, intense uh, lecture last um, Wednesday. Um, so hopefully this one, we kind of like a cool down because like, I think everyone kind of understands how, how buoyancy works. We're just going to put some equations and we're going to put some numbers on. Okay? Um, so that should take us maybe like 20, 30 minutes. And then after that, we're going to start our next unit on the Bernoulli equation. So uh, the Bernoulli equation is, is pretty exciting. So it's uh, our first kind of foray into fluid dynamics, which has to do with kind of fluids in motion, which is, you know, what we'll be studying for the rest of the, the course. And Bernoulli is kind of like the, the first and kind of simplest um, equation for us to do that. Um, so it's, you know, relatively simple compared to, you know, something like Navier-Stokes, but it's still really powerful in that it's, uh, it gives you a lot of information for a relatively low amount of effort. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so before we get started today, uh, are there uh, any questions on, I know I posted in homework last week. Uh, are there any questions on the homework or just anything that we covered uh, last week that I could uh, answer? Well, I was actually having a bit of a trouble just trying to uh, visualize how to set up the uh, homework when you're dealing with the uh, the way the fluids are like transgressing amongst each other. How you set up the equations into like uh, piecewise-ish. Um, I was wondering if you can go over that once more, or will that be something that's like office hours, probably? Uh, which which problem are you talking about? Um, well, I was working on number two, part A. I was just like looking at the. Uh, at the uh, example problem and um, at our notes and like, I was just trying to see how do you uh, set it up? Sure, yeah, I can, we can go over that just uh, really quick. So, so, two, uh, so problem two um, is a monometer problem. So that's what we did kind of a, um, a couple weeks ago. Um, and it's asking, it's a, it's, it's a monometer in a very specific configuration and it's called a differential monometer. So um, this, this one's actually used quite often in practice because it's, uh, it gives you kind of all the benefits of a, of a manometer in kind of a relatively small amount of space. But even though it's, it's kind of an interesting geometry, all the same principles kind of apply here. Okay, okay so we have something like this. And then we have another fluid in here. And so to basically the, the way that you're going to set this up is basically the same as, as all our manometer problems is that we're going to be looking at changes in height, right? And so the, the goal with manometry is to measure pressure differences, right? And so what we want to find out is we have a point A right here, basically, and we have a point B, okay? And so what's happening here is that there's flow that's going on here. So the flu is actually moving, okay? So the, the figure I think is a little bit tricky because I, I think, you know, everything that we went over in fluid statics is that, you know, we have A and B here, they're at the same height. And so you would think that they have the same pressure, but because there's fluid motion here, there's, there's actually going to be a difference in pressure. And we'll actually see why that is today in the Bernoulli equation. It's actually, um, um, you know, a nice, uh, a nice kind of segue to that. And so what, in, in order to find basically PA minus PB, the way that you're going to do that is you're actually going to work your way up the manometer. So actually, you know, let me redraw this. So A and B are actually right here. Okay. okay. And so the way you're going to do this, you're going to kind of work your way around the manometer. So first you're going to go from point A and you can make kind of an imaginary point here, like point one. Okay. And so, um, you know, even though the fluid is, is in motion down here, actually in the manometer, the flu is actually going to be still. So actually you can move up here. And since these guys are at the same height, they're going to be at the same pressure. So you're going to start basically collecting pressure differences according to the height. So uh, we know that uh, from manometry, P1 minus P2 is equal to uh, gamma H, right? So it's just the density times gravity times the H difference, right? And so you're basically going to use this equation, work your way around the horn until you reach point B, and then you're gonna have a, basically a set of, I think uh, in this case, three, um, three equations, um, and then you're basically gonna solve them together in order to get this quantity right here, PA minus PB, yeah. Okay. 
Does that make that make it make a little bit more sense? Uh, a bit. Yeah. So uh, so there's a question in the uh, in the chat. So how do you know when to make gamma H positive or negative, right? So remember, um, what we know from hydrostatics is that points that are at a deeper depth are always going to be at a higher pressure, right? And so I think the convention that we, we chose was that if we, P1 was always going to be the higher point, and P2 is going to be the low point, right? And so if we uh, take the difference between P, uh, uh, pressure at a higher point versus minus pressure at a low point, that's always going to be a negative number because the pressure at the low point is going to be higher than the pressure at the, at the high point. And so in this case, uh, yeah, I kind, of, I kind of miswrote it at first. We have a minus gamma H because we're going from um, up here down to down here. Okay? And so let's let's do kind of this first pressure difference here. So we call this point one. We can do point one minus P A is equal to. And we'll say that we know the gamma here. So this gamma one is the minus gamma one H one, right? And so it's negative because we have the higher um, point P one. So this is at a higher elevation and then minus PA, and then that's going to be equal to minus gamma 1 H1. Mm -hmm. So yeah. once again, uh, when it comes to writing the uh, pressures, you start with high to low? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think always... that's the easiest. Yeah, I think that's the easiest just to kind of keep one convention for it. Um, if you go high to low, then you put a negative one on the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you, if you have more questions on this, or you have more trouble, you know, you can pop into office hours. Um, but that's, but that's kind of based in the basic setup of the problem. Okay, okay so I got another question in the chat um, and we, uh, he wants to go over the setup for problem 3B. Sure, I can do that. So problem three is, uh, uh, is um, regarding forces on hydrostatic surfaces. So it's basically this, the, um, you know, the, uh, the topic that we went over last time, okay? And so the situation looks something like this. And so uh, 3A actually has a vertical um, post but in 3B, what you have here is a post, or a, um, not a post, a, uh, a gate that's angled with uh, respect to the horizontal. Okay? And so I think in the problem, I say that's 45 degrees. Okay? And so what I want you to solve for in problem 3B is what is the height that's required to keep this gate in equilibrium? Okay. Okay. Um, and so if you did problem 3A, you know, problem 3B is going to be you know, um, the same. Except the only thing is that your angle here is going to be 45 degrees. Okay? And so that complicates things a little bit because um, if you kind of go back into the notes, um, this is actually um, very similar to the, uh, to the first example we, that we did for the curved gate uh, or for the angled gate. Okay? And so if you look at, let's see, the example that starts on page 17 of the food statics lecture notes, um, you would have to kind of go through that same process. Um, and I think the tricky part here is that since because you have an angled gate, this height is going to be different from this length right here. Okay? And so like, when you're solving for the uh, um, when you're solving for the magnitude of the pressure force, you would take this depth actually right here. So that's the vertical depth. So that's the height of the centroid. Okay? But when you're solving for the location of the of the uh, of the uh, um, of the force, you're actually going to use this length right here, okay? Because remember, the uh, the location of the static of the hydrostatic force is given in terms of y, not h. And so, when you're doing these problems, especially on angled gates, you have to kind of make that differentiation between h and y. Um, but if you know if you've done three a, it's, it's it's relatively the same. It's just that additional wrinkle with like some from with some geometry. Um, so if you look at the the example on um, page 17 of the of the lecture notes, that should kind of give you some hints on how you should proceed and how you how you can deal with the different lengths and the different angles. So, yeah, it's 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 tricky at first, but I think uh, you know once you kind of work through the math a little bit, then it becomes a bit more clear. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know if you if you have more questions on this, I'm happy to go over this more in, in office hours. Um, but I think probably we should we should probably get going on the lecture today. Uh, but are there any other uh, quick questions um, that I can answer before we get started? Okay. Okay, so the topic today is uh, buoyancy and flotation. Right? So I think, you know, compared to what we went over last week, I think this is a little bit more intuitive because we know that, you know, if you place an object in water, you know, if it has a certain density or, you know, a certain kind of properties, it, it will either float or sink. Okay. Okay. 
the funny thing is that even though flotation looks like a, you know, it's, it's a word that we say all the time, you know, whenever I type it into like a, like a Word document or in an email, you know, they, they think that it's spelled incorrectly or they don't think it's a word, but I, you know, it looks like kind of a word to me, right? Okay, so the basic idea is this, right? So if we have kind of an object, so if we, let me draw like a, like a potato here, right? <clears throat> we know just by, the, by nature of being on Earth, and Earth has its own gravitational field, we know that there's always going to be a weight force, right? Okay. So there's always going to be a force that kind of brings us down to Earth. You know, otherwise, we'd all be floating everywhere, and there'd be you know, even more chaos than there is right now. And so I'm going to write the weight into a, uh, uh, um, you know, a, a form um, where normally you would you would you know multiply the mass times the gravity, right? But because we're in fluids, you know, we we don't think of mass all that often. We think of density, right? So the weight of an object will be the density multiplied by v. So v is the volume of the of the object multiplied by g. Okay. And so basically what I, what I did was I took the mass of the object and I expressed it in terms of density and volume. Okay. Um, so everyone I think is pretty familiar with, you know, weight. And so what buoyancy basically says that if your, if your object is suspended in a fluid, um, there's going to be a force that actually opposes the weight. Okay. okay. And so call that FB. So FB stands for a buoyant force. And then the magnitude of this buoyant force will be simply um, density times the volume of the object times gravity, okay? So it looks uh, similar, but I'm gonna add one wrinkle in here, okay? And so the difference between the buoyant force and weight is actually in the density. So it's, uh, whereas the weight, you know, you consider the weight of the density of the actual object itself, but for the buoyant force, the density that we use is the density of this of the surrounding fluid. Okay. okay. So just to kind of emphasize this, let me draw. Let me go to water waves. Okay. <clears throat> and so what this basically says is that if you have like say. Um, you know, say like a, like, a, like a piece of chalk or something like that, okay? And you put, you took that piece of chalk, or maybe, maybe not chalk. Let's do, a, let's just do a rock, okay? So let's, uh, let's say you take a rock and then you dropped it into a glass of water, okay? And so that rock will have a weight that's pulling it down and that's simply its weight. And so the weight will be the density of the rock times the volume of the rock times gravity. Okay? But there will be a force that opposes this going in the opposite direction. And this will be the buoyant force. And then the, this buoyant force will be the density of the water, not the rock, multiplied by the volume of the rock times gravity, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so that's all that, that, that's, this is basically all there is to, to buoyancy. So we, basically whenever you have a, a, an object in suspended fluid, there's a, a, a force that um, opposes the weight, okay? And then the kind of the formal ways to say that is the, the magnitude of the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid that's displaced, okay? And then we'll, I'll, I'll put formal words on that on the next page, but this is kind of just the, the general idea of, of buoyancy. Uh, any are there any questions on on this? Okay. Okay, and so um, the uh, the actual physical law, or the uh, you know the the person that actually discovered buoyancy, it's credited to someone named Archimedes. So this might be someone that you've heard before. And so his uh, whole idea of uh, of flotation and buoyancy is uh, summarized in Archimedes' principle. Just a side note, and I, I, I've, I've always said this, is that I've, I've always hated it when like famous scientists name formulas and, and, and their uh, physical laws after themselves, because if you tell someone you know, who has no idea what flotation is about Archimedes principle, that doesn't tell you anything about it, right? It's, uh, it's just some dude's name and he named a principle after himself. It's only when you actually study that you actually find out what it is. I, I think it'd be a lot more helpful if people said that this is the buoyancy principle, because then you would know, you know what it means, but you know, 
scientists are, are vain people, so they got to put their names on stuff, I guess. Okay, so what Archimedes principle says that the magnitude, I can stop hitting the erase button. of the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the submerged object. Okay, and that's basically exactly what we saw on the previous page. So whenever you, uh, you place an object in a fluid, um, you know, it's gonna displace some of that fluid just because that object itself is gonna be taking up some, some space. And so if you, if you compute the weight of the amount of fluid that's displaced, that's the magnitude of the upward buoyant force. Okay? And so those are kind of the two things that, um, you know, I, I want you to kind of remember about buoyancy is that, first of all, it, it's, a, it's a force that always opposes the weight. So it's always gonna be an upward force. And then the other thing is that the magnitude of this force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. Okay? And so in order to compute that, you basically just take the volume of your object and you multiply it by the density of the fluid and then, and then you multiply it by gravity. Okay? And so this, this uh, kind of gives us a principle or a, a way to basically determine if an object's going to float. Okay? And so let's draw my potato here. And so basically an, an object is going to float. Be, so basically, you know, we know that we always have these two opposing forces. So we have the weight going down and the buoyant force going up, okay? And so if we have a case where the density of the object is less than the density of the fluid, okay? Right? So in the case where we have the density of the object less than the density of the fluid, we know that the, uh, um, the upward buoyant force is going to have a greater magnitude than the object's weight. And so in this case, the object's going to float. Okay. okay. And so the opposite case for this is when the density of the object is greater than the density of the fluid. Okay. So in those cases, the uh, the weight is going to be more than the uh, um, than the buoyant force, and the object is going to sink. Okay, and so if you're uh, you know if you have an object and you want to see whether it's going to sink or float um, in any kind of fluid, so not just water, you can basically just compare their density. So if the density if if the density of the object is less, then it's going to float. Otherwise, it's going to sink because the uh, you know there's that always there's always that balance between the buoyant force and uh, and and weight basically. All right, are there uh, any questions on, on this? Okay, so let's do an example that kind of illustrates this, um, you know, and, and kind of in, a, in a, a situation, okay? And so let's say that you're working for a, uh, um, you know, a sports, uh, a sports equipment company, okay? And uh, your new task or your new project is to design a new life jacket, okay? Okay. Um, and so life jackets, you know, are, are, you know, very essential safety devices for, uh, you know, for any kind of, uh, um, you know, boat or um, situation, okay? And so it's, it's subject to, to regulations. So uh, according to U.S. Coast Guard regulations, the, uh, the life jacket, it must provide at least a minimum of 22 pounds of upward force. Okay. Right. And so to basically provide this force, we're going to be, um, you know, 
making a large part of our life jacket out of foam because foam is a foam, foam is a really nice material to use for life jackets because it can take up a lot of volume, but its density is, is really, really small. Okay. And so in this case, um, the specific gravity of foam, remember specific uh, or specific weight. So the specific weight is nothing more than the density multiplied by gravity. Okay. Um, so the specific gravity is going to be two pounds per feet cubed. Okay. Okay. And so, um, you know, so the majority of our life jackets be be made of foam, but our life jacket is also made of some other materials. So you know, we have the uh, the coatings on top, where there's also you know safety features like a like a flashlight or something, and the tags to inflate it. Okay. And so the other remaining materials we know has a weight of 1.3 pounds. Okay. And so if we know that this life jacket has to support a weight of 22 pounds, in addition to that 1.3 pounds of the X material, we need to find out, um, you know, what's the volume of foam that our, our life jacket needs to have. Okay. Okay. And so uh, as it's always useful for these kind of fluid statics problems, let's draw a free body diagram. Okay. All right. Um, okay. And so let's draw a life jacket. That will be a rectangle. Okay. We're taking, uh, you know, this like a um, abstract art. So you have to use your imagination. So imagine this is a life jacket, right? And so, there's going to be an upward force. And so this is going to be um, equal to um, the specific weight of water multiplied by the volume of the life jacket. Okay. I should give you the specific weight of water, which I don't have here. Oh, here it is. Okay. So the specific weight of water in these units is 64 pounds per feet cubed. Okay. So you can see we compare that to the specific weight of foam and specific weight of foam is, is significantly less than that. Okay. okay. And so that's the only upward force that we have. So we actually have three downward forces here. And so the first weight that we uh, that we have is the is the amount of weight that um, our life jacket must support. And so we know that this is going to be 22 pounds. Okay. Okay. And so we'll call that force F U. Um, so um, you know U being user. So you know uh, that was actually that was that was actually unintentional. Okay. And so we'll have uh, W O. So W O will be all the weight of the other stuff. So we know from the problem this is 1.3 pounds. Okay. And we actually have one more force here, okay? And so, you know, because we're making this life jacket out of foam, the foam itself actually has some weight too, right? So remember, we know that the net force on the object is always gonna be the, um, the, the difference between the upward buoyant force and the weight of that object. So this foam actually has some weight, as you can see there. And so we need to take that into account into our calculation. So this will be WF. So this is the weight of the foam. Okay. And then from up there, we know that there's gonna be WF for W uh, or gamma F for, uh, um, for the specific weight of the foam times volume, okay? And so what we have here is uh, you know, a free body diagram and all we gotta do is sum up the forces and then solve for P. Okay, are there uh, any questions on the, uh, uh, on the problem setup? Okay. 
<clears throat> so let's actually uh, solve this guy. So if we sum up all the forces in the y direction, okay, because you know we, we only have forces going in that direction. And so because we want an equilibrium situation, we're going to set this equal to zero, right? And then all we got to do now is we got to sum up all the forces. So we have FB, the weight, the force of the user, okay? We have the weight of the foam, and then we have the weight of the other stuff, okay? And so let's go ahead and just plug in all the numbers and all the expressions that we know from this, okay? So we have zero equal to we know the buoyant force is going to be equal to the specific weight of the water multiplied the by the volume of the foam. Okay. We know the weight of the user is going to be 22 pounds. Okay. Um, we know that the weight of the foam, this is going to be W foam or, or gamma F times the volume. Okay. And then the weight of the other stuff is 1.3 pounds. And so now that we have this expression, we can solve for um, the volume, okay? So let's go ahead and do that. So if we move 22 and 1.3 to the other side, we have 23.3 uh, pounds is equal to the volume. And I'm just gonna combine these guys together. So we have um, gamma water minus gamma foam, okay? And so we have 23.3 divided by gamma water minus gamma foam, okay? And we know gamma water here is 64 pounds per feet cubed, okay? And we know gamma foam is two pounds per feet cubed, okay? And so we plug all that in, we get a volume of 0 0.376 feet cubed, okay? And so you know that when you're designing your life jacket, you know that the volume that the foam has to take up is at least 0 0.376 feet cubed, okay? And if you have that volume of foam, then your life jacket will be able to support, um, you know, very small child, basically, okay? Right, any questions on, uh, on this example here? All right, shoot. Yeah, so this, so for this particular problem, you know, US Coast Guard regulation said you, the life jacket has to at least support a 22 pound person. Uh, and so, you know, if you put this life jacket on a 22 pound person, they'll float perfectly without any, um, you know, any help. Um, and so um, I think, you know, that's, that's kind of the bare minimums, you know, obviously this, you know, most humans are, are a lot more than 22 pounds. Uh, but even for, you know, a, a, an, adult, an adult person, so if you put this life jacket on them, it will at least provide, um, you know, 22 pounds of uh, support for them, you know, so that, you know, they'll, they'll might, they'll still have to swim, but it'll be 22 pounds easier. So they won't have to, you know, swim as, as much. So, I mean, this is, this is kind of the bare minimum. So, you know, most of the times when you're designing these life jackets, you have kind of a target audience in mind. And, you know, if you're going to design this for a human, you're going to support a lot more weight than just 22 pounds, but this is kind of just the bare, bare minimum. Mm -hmm. yep. Any other questions on, on this? Um, when the, Sorry, um, when it's when you mean float, does that indicate above the surface or could it be floating, let's say, mid surface? That's a great question. So actually, that's that's the next thing that we're going to go over. And that's uh, that's with regards to uh, stability. So um, you're right. So a lot of times, like when you have an object that floats, a lot of it's actually going to be above the water. And that actually changes the behavior a little bit. And so that's that's actually the next thing we're going to go over. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. So a small, so as we move on, kind of a small funny story related to my a little bit of a snafu earlier. So I, I had a good friend in graduate school. His name was uh, Vijay. Um, so he's you know from India, um, and so we were going over a uh, um, um, a, a, a figure, and there is a you know where we have a, a lot of velocities going on. So there was one velocity um, that was um, v sub j. Okay, and so um, we were going over it, and then the next on the next page it disappeared. Um, and then my friend VJ is like, oh, I can't find VJ. I'm like, what do you mean you can't find VJ? You are VJ. So I thought it was hilarious, but no one else laughed. But, you know, I'm kind of weird like that. 
Um, okay. Um, so one more, one more comment on this, um, you know, before we move on. So this is with regards to your homework problem. Okay. And so we've, we've gone over buoyancy with respect to, uh, you know, a solid object suspended in fluid, but buoyancy actually applies to fluids that are suspended in fluids too. And so the situation that you're going to be going over in the homework problem is that of a hot air balloon. Okay. Okay. And so for a hot air balloon, the way it works is that you have a something that looks like this. And so, you know, the way hot air balloons is that works is that you have a flame that's on the bottom here. So you're going to heat the air. Okay. So on the inside of the balloon, you have hot air, but on the outside of the balloon, you have cold air. Okay. And so one thing about density is that as you heat it up, you know, you heat a fluid up, the density tends to get less. Okay. And so by having hot air inside this balloon and cold air outside, you know, you're creating kind of the same thing that you have with, uh, uh, with an object where you have a, an object with less density on the inside um, versus um, cold air that's on the outside. Okay? And so the way that you know the buoyancy situation works here, okay. So in order the uh, what the hot air basically does is that it, it basically reduces the overall weight of the hot air balloon. Okay? So the hot air balloon is trapped you in a bunch of air like this, and so the weight of that air actually contributes to the weight. And so uh, you know the uh, the weight that you can consider is you can say that the weight of the uh, of the hot air balloon, or at least one thing that contributes to it, is the density of the hot air times the volume uh, times gravity. Okay, and then the buoyant force, which is you know the fluid that's um, that the hot air balloon suspended in. The way that you can compute this is the density of the cold air multiplied by the same volume times gravity. And so since the density of the cold air is higher than that of the hot air, you have a net upward force for the hot air balloon. And that's, that's kind of how it works. So, and so for that problem, you know, this, uh, um, you know, this, this hint should, should help you guys out because, you know, not only do you need to consider the, the upward point force, but, you know, all, you also need to consider the weight itself of the hot air balloon. So like when you're computing the tension in the wires, um, you know, make sure you consider these, uh, these guys correctly. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, so that's kind of the hint on the homework problem, okay? <clears throat> so let's move on to kind of the last thing for buoyancy, which is stability, okay? So this kind of goes back to, uh, to Manuel's question about, uh, you know, what happens when you have an object that's partially suspended, okay? And so, um, you know, uh, so if you have a case where, you know, the density of the fluid uh, or the density of the object is less than the fluid, you know, your object's going to float, right? But when an object floats, you know, there's always, there's, um, you know, it never floats kind of perfectly on top of the water. So it's not really like, you know, Jesus walking on water, right? And so what tends to happen is something like this, right? So you have your surface of the water and then you have, um, you know, part of the object that's kind of sticking out and then part of the object that's, uh, that's underneath. And so in these cases, um, you know, the upward buoyant force, you have to consider that the, uh, um, the only thing that's, um, or the only upward force that you're gonna have is the buoyant force that's only for the part that's submerged. Okay. So in order to compute the upward buoyant force, you would do um, same thing. So density of the fluid times gravity. Okay. And then instead of multiplying by the volume of the entire object, you would multiply by just the volume that's submerged, okay? And so if I go like this, okay? And so for the, the volume of the submerged object, you would just take, you know, the volume of the part that's underneath. Okay. And then this is basically gonna be perfectly balanced by the weight, where the weight is still the same. The weight is still going to be the density of the object times gravity times volume, and this is the total volume of the entire thing. So these two guys are um, in equilibrium with each other. Okay. 
Okay. Um, but I want to draw your attention to uh, to something else. Okay. So as we as we learned from you know the last section, so not only is the the magnitude of these forces that are important, the location of these forces are, are important too. Okay. And so let's start with the weight. Okay. So I'm going to use green for the weight here. Okay. And so since the weight kind of acts for the entire object, if we if we kind of put a, a force vector on it, that force vector will be located at the centroid of the object. And so if you wanted to draw just a resultant force vector or one force vector to represent this, you would draw the origin of this to be at the, at the centroid of that object. Um, but when you have a partially submerged object like this, you know, the buoyant force is not going to be acting at the centroid of the object. And so the location for the buoyant force, it's actually going to be acting at the centroid, but at the centroid of only the part that's submerged. And so, you know, if you're, so if your object is fully submerged in the water, these two would be the same thing because the entire object is submerged. And so the, the centroid of the submerged part will coincide with the centroid of the object itself. Okay. Um, but, you know, if your object is only partially submerged, then these two guys are going to be um, different. Actually, let me make one um, small correction here. Sorry about that. And so, because this will be important in the next part. And so the weight actually acts at these, um, I think what's called the center of gravity. And so if you have an object where, you know, the weight's kind of shifted to one side, you know, uh, that's going to shift the center of gravity a bit. Sorry about that. So that was a kind of one small correction there. And so what we're going to see in the next page is that if you have an object where, you know, the weight's kind of centered all at the bottom, it's going to shift the center of gravity below the, the centroid. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this? Okay, so let's, uh, so actually, let's actually look at two situations like, like that. Okay, so let's take a, a situation where let's say that we have, you know, let's just, uh, just for the case of simplicity, let's consider just cases where our object is fully submerged. Okay. So let me draw kind of a, an oval, okay. And at the bottom of this oval, let's say that we have a weight. So let's say that we have, um, you know, a, a thing of plastic, but at the bottom, there's, there's kind of a heavy weight that's to it. And so, um, you know, because we have that weight at the bottom, it's going to shift the center of gravity kind of below the, the object. Okay. And so the, uh, you know, the way the, the part where the, uh, um, the gravity force acts or the weight is going to be shifted below, um, its centroid. Okay. Whereas, um, you know, opposing this, we have our buoyant force, but since this object is fully submerged, the buoyant force is going to act um, directly at the centroid. And so what I've drawn for you here is basically a situation where the weight um, acts below the, the, uh, um, the buoyant force, okay? And so this, this particular situation where the weight acts below the centroid, And so when the weight acts below the centroid, this is a situation where we call stable buoyancy, okay? Right? 
Um, and so the reason we call the stable buoyancy is that, you know, this object will tend to kind of return to the situation. And so let's say, you know, we take this object and we just, you know, we poke it. So let's say that we, you know, we, we take a force and then we kind of poke it like, like that. Okay. And so that's going to cause the object to rotate or it's going to cause it to, you know, perturb like this. Okay. And so for a stable equilibrium switch, um, situation or stable buoyancy, what's going to happen is that after we poke it and it kind of, you know, does its thing, it's going to return to the exact same position because the weight kind of balances it out and it kind of wants to return down to there. And so intuitively, I, I, you know, I, I think, you know, this makes a lot of sense because that weight, because the weight's at the bottom, it's going to be, it's going to want to be at the bottom of the object. So if you poke it, then the weight's going to naturally just return back to there. Okay. So let's contrast this with, uh, with kind of the opposite situation. Where we have kind of a similarly shaped object, but instead the weight is at the top. Okay. So let's say that we have our weight force. And then in blue here, we have our buoyant force still acting at the centroid, okay, right? So in this situation, the weight acts above centroid, okay? And so when the weight acts above the centroid, this is unstable. And so the reason it's unstable is, is, is kind of the same thing where like if we try to poke this or we, you know, we, we disturb it, we perturb it, what's going to happen is that this object's not going to return to the same position. It's going to want to find a new equilibrium um, situation, okay? And so actually for this simple situation, if we poke this guy, then the weight is actually going to rotate onto the bottom, okay? And so it's unstable because it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't return to that same position. And so this, uh, so this whole idea of stability has important implications for, uh, for boat design, actually. And so, you know, if you're riding in a, in a boat, you know, any kind of boat, like a rowboat or like a, like a big cruise ship, right? You want your boat to be in a stable, um, a stable buoyancy situation because, you know, you don't want, you don't want a situation where your, your boat is really top heavy. So all the, uh, all the heavy equipment's up top. Then if a, a wave or something hits your boat, then the boat just totally capsizes because you're unstable, right? And so what you want is you want to, uh, you know, when you're designing boats, what they do is that they try to load all the heavy machinery and all the heavy, you know, engines and stuff near the bottom of the boat. And so the reason for that is they're trying to create a stable equilibrium solution. So if, you know, wind or waves or, you know, angry people maybe or an angry, you know, shark, you know, comes and hits your boat, what's going to happen is that your boat's not going to just automatically topple. You know, it might, it might disturb a little bit, but, you know, ultimately it's going to return back to the same position because you have a stable equilibrium solution where all the weight is at the bottom of your object. Okay. All right. So there's a, so there's a comment in the chat that says, uh, so it acts like a counterbalance. That's exactly how it works. And so you want to set it up so that the weight is, is basically as far below your object as possible. So it acts as, as a counterbalance to the buoyancy force and any kind of disturbance that's, that's going to be. Hi, Professor, just uh, want to double check uh, the forces of buoyancy that are acting on the centroid. Uh, they're going directly upward, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just just so it didn't overlap with the force, I kind of drew it off to the side, but there it's it's going ver perfectly vertically upward. All right. Just making sure. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Any final questions on uh, on buoyancy before we move on to Bernoulli? Okay, and so that's it for, for fluid statics. So, you know, um, it's, it's a long unit, I know. It's, uh, there's a lot of fluid statics, but, you know, that's actually the last that we're going to see of fluids that stay still. So actually from every point onward now, we're only going to be considering fluids in motion, okay? And so our first kind of foray into this is um, with the Bernoulli equation. Okay. And so the Bernoulli equation, you know, is it's kind of a big paradigm shift from what we've been doing before, because now we're going to be considering only fluid dynamics. Okay. So dynamics is kind of the opposite of fluid statics, where, you know, statics is fluids that are staying still. Fluid dynamics are fluids that are going to be motion. Okay. 
And so what's going to be important uh, here and, you know, everything moving forward is that, you know, uh, we have to be able to describe this motion and kind of the most, uh, the most popular way and kind of the easiest way to describe motion is to think about the fluid's velocity. And so this is going to be a really prominent thing where it's basically going to be showing up everywhere where, you know, we have a, you know, not only a fluid, but the fluid's going to be in motion. And the way that we describe that motion is the, uh, it's, it's velocity. Okay. And so some, um, you know, popular situations is you could have like a, like an airfoil. Okay. And we have air going over that airfoil. And so what we'll actually see is that, you know, the Bernoulli equation gives us a very, you know, a very elementary understanding of, of lift, okay? Right? And so since this fluid is flowing over the airfoil, it has some velocity, okay? Right? So another situation that you might see in your garden is that you might have water coming out of your hose, okay? And so in both these cases, you know, the fluid is not just staying still, it's actually moving, okay? So it has some velocity. And we'll uh, and the Bernoulli equation will kind of give us a, a way to kind of analyze these situations. Okay. okay. And so I'll make one comment um, now. That's that's going to be a, um, you know applied throughout. Is that um, you know the Bernoulli equation? It's it's something that's relatively simple, but in its simplicity, it comes with a lot of restrictions. So um, you know the flows that we're going to consider with Bernoulli are very ideal flows. And by ideal means that we have to make a lot of assumptions. Okay. okay. And so, you know, if you're going to be applying, if you, if, you know, after this unit, you go out and apply Bernoulli to, you know, an actual realistic situation, you might find that the results are actually not that accurate. Um, and that's because, you know, most situations you can't apply all these assumptions. But, you know, the reason we start with Bernoulli is that, you know, it really gives us kind of a, a, a fundamental kind of intuition and understanding of how fluids flow and how all the different factors relate. Um, and so that's kind of the reason why we, we start with this. Okay. okay. Um, so any, any questions before we start um, um, deriving the Bernoulli equation? Yeah, so this so this diagram right here is uh you can this is actually an airfoil. Okay, so if you look at the uh, um, you know you're flying in an airplane, this is kind of a cross section of the wing, um, and so uh, basically what I'm showing here is kind of the air that's kind of flowing around the wing that's going like that. Yeah, and then the second one is my best uh, impression of a of a garden hose. Okay, so let's uh, so let's start going. Okay, and so our first step um, is to actually consider uh, Newton's second law. Okay. okay, and so just because a fluid is is you know a little bit um, different than a solid, you know Newton's law is still applied to it. So we're going to apply Newton's law. And we're also going to introduce the uh, the concept of a streamline, okay, and what that actually is. Okay. Okay. Um, and so you know, I know we just finished the fluid statics um, um, portion, but normally, you know, what um, Newton's second law says is that if you sum up all the forces that are acting on an object, this is equal to the mass of the object times its acceleration. Okay. And so you know. Um, even fluids can't kind of escape the, uh, um, you know, the, the laws of, of Newton. So Newton was kind of an almighty kind of figure, right? Uh, and so what we're going to be doing is we're going to apply this to a, a specific particle of fluid. So you can kind of think of this as kind of like a fluid droplet or maybe like a molecule of fluid, you know, kind of in the, in the, in the sense. Um, but this is going to be, you know, kind of our starting point. And so by applying this on a fluid particle and considering, you know, all the typical forces that a fluid particle experiences, 
we'll finally arrive at the Bernoulli equation. Okay, okay. and so on the previous um, slide, what I said that um, was that in order to apply a Bernoulli, we have to apply a lot of assumptions. And so our first assumption is gonna come right here, okay? Uh, and so what we're going to assume is that we're going to ignore the effects of viscosity. Okay. And so this is actually a pretty big one because viscosity, you know, does, does play a pretty important role. Um, you know, uh, and the and the role of viscosity is going to uh, to vary according to you know what kind of flow it is. And so the fact that we're ignoring viscosity means that we're ignoring a very fundamental part of fluid flow. Okay, uh, but you know if you consider kind of very specific situations, this assumption is actually you know pretty reasonable. And so some assumptions where this could be reasonable, where is uh, you know if you have uh, other forces on the fluid that dominate. So what we'll see is that some of the other forces are pressure and gravity. And so for situations where you have, you know, a really high pressure or, you know, gravity kind of dominates, then this assumption is pretty reasonable, okay? Um, or, you know, this is, this is reasonable for fluids where the viscosity is really low. And so, so a lot of gases, you know, as, as we kind of observed from before, a lot of gases have very low viscosity. So if you're thinking like air or, you know, or, or nitrogen or something like that, um, you know, those tend to have very low viscosity. So in those situations, you know, you can kind of safely ignore viscosity. Um, but if you're considering, you know, the flow of water through a pipe, you know, viscosity plays a pretty important role and this, this assumption can't really apply. So, um, you know, just for this unit, and I think, you know, not actually not until after the midterm, um, you know, we're going to be ignoring the effects of viscosity. So, um, you know, I, I don't want you guys to forget about viscosity, but I want you guys just mostly just to be aware that we're assuming that we can ignore it. Um, and, you know, there are some situations where you, there, there are some situations where you can actually do this. Um, but, you know, this is still something important that we've got to bring back later in the class, okay? Okay, um, so that's the, our big assumption that we're going to make, and so let's talk about um, streamlines. Okay. And so the definition of a streamline are, uh, you know, lines that you can, you can draw in space and these lines are gonna be um, tangent to the velocity vectors of a fluid everywhere. And so kind of the, uh, I'll draw a couple of streamlines here. So, you know, I, I kind of implicitly drew these on the previous page with air going over uh, an airfoil, okay? Um, and so, um, you know, the way I, I like to visualize streamlines is that imagine you have like a, like a stream or a river that's, that's going, right? And you wanna draw this, this stream or this river and you wanna show the direction of the flow, right? And so the way that you would draw the stream of the river is that you would draw kind of lines that follow the river's um, path and you would draw an arrow to kind of indicate which direction that the, the flow is going. So streamlines are, you know, they're essentially intuitively just that. So streamlines are just lines that just follow the flow. Um, and kind of the formal way that you can describe that is that they're going to be tangent to the velocity vector everywhere. Okay. And so along these streamlines, we can draw little fluid particles. And so because these fluid particles are, uh, you know, following the flow, you know, they're, uh, they're basically going to be following these streamlines. So another way you can think of streamlines is that these streamlines kind of represent like a roller coaster track. Okay? And then the fluid particles are just the cars that are fly, uh, riding on this track. And so, um, yeah, so the, you know, the particles, you know, in this case, they're, they're going to be following the streamline and they can't hop across streamlines. Okay. Um, and so the, the fluid particles, you know, once they kind of settle onto a streamline, they're going to be basically trapped on that streamline and they just follow this path until, until the end. Okay. Um, okay. Um, are there any questions on, on this? Okay. 
And so that kind of brings us to our, our second assumption. Okay. And so I drew the streamlines on the previous page. Um, and you know, what, what I kind of implicitly was kind of saying was that those streamlines are not going to change. Okay. And so what this basically is assuming is that our flow is going to be steady. And so steady basically means that it, it's not changing with time. Okay. Um, so this is kind of a, you know, a not, an, not really an intuitive concept, I think, you know, when you're first coming across fluids, because when you think of something that's steady, you think of a static object that's, that's not really moving at all, right? So a steady would be something like, you know, like, a, like you know, an object that's just sitting on your, um, on your desk, right? Um, but for fluids, the concept of steady kind of takes a, a little bit of a different meaning, okay? And so when I say steady, what I mean is that the velocities are not changing with time. Okay. And so when you say that you have a steady flow, it's, that's different from saying uh, that the flow is static. Okay. So a static flow is, is it, or so a static fluid is something that we've been studying for the last couple of weeks. And that's a fluid where there's no motion at all. There's no velocity. And so that's different from a steady flow. So a steady flow just means that the velocities are not changing with time. Okay? And so if you have flow that's in a river, right? Uh, you know, what's happening is that the, the, you know, the fluid's actually moving in that river, but the fluid is not really accelerating or it's not jumping out of the, or you know, the direction's not really changing, right? And so what we can say is that the flow in that river is steady because the velocity vectors are, are always going to be the same. And so uh, that's the case here. So basically, when you draw streamlines, well, if you assume that those streamlines for the fluid are not changing with time, then we can say that the flow is steady. Okay? And this is so this is a, an important assumption for Bernoulli is because, you know, what, what's going to happen is that we're going to we're going to basically apply Newton's second law along a streamline. And we have in order to actually apply that, we have to assume that that streamline is not going to change at all. So the fluid particle is just going to keep following that streamline. Right? And so it's it's kind of a, a, a Kind of a subtle difference between static and steady, but you know that's that's one thing that I, I really want to kind of emphasize is that you know just because you have a steady flow doesn't mean that it's not moving, you know. So when you say you have a steady flow, the flow could be moving, but you know the velocities itself and the, and the fluid are not going to be changing with time. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's our our second assumption. Okay. And so let me draw another streamline. Okay. Let me draw just one. And we'll draw a fluid particle. Okay. So remember, this is a kind of a, a speck of a fluid, or like you can think of it as a molecule fluid. Okay. And let me describe the the position. Okay. Right. So this S right here. This S represents the position of a fluid particle along streamline. And this is actually a function of time. Okay. And so what I have right here is uh, S at T1. So S at T1, this, this is kind of like the position of that fluid particle at, at time one. Okay. And then in a, a certain amount of time, the fluid particle is going to change position. So remember, you know, we have some velocity in, the, in this flow. So that velocity is going to push this fluid particle from the position at S at T1 onto uh, the position S at T2. Okay. So we can say that the fluid particle moves from position S at T1 to S at T2, okay, right? And so the key here is, uh, uh, is that word along, okay, right? So S basically just describes the position of the fluid particle along the streamline, and then as time goes on, then the, the position of that fluid particle is going to change. Okay. 
Okay. Um, and so, um, you know, because we have a position that's changing with time, we can use this to actually describe the particle speed or its velocity, right? And so we know that um, velocity is nothing more than just the derivative of position, okay? And so since our position um, function here is given by s, right, our particle speed is nothing more than just ds dt, And then from now on, I'm going to give this the symbol u, okay? Right? And so from now on, you know, whenever you see u, u is going to be um, velocity. Not u, u, but the letter, the letter u. Okay. Right? Any questions on, on this guy? Okay. Okay, so that's velocity. So we know that velocity is nothing more than just the, the derivative of the part of the particle's position uh, with respect to time. Okay. And so, you know, we can take the derivative of this one more time to get acceleration. And so acceleration, we know, is that is uh, nothing more than just the derivative of velocity with respect to time. Okay. Okay. Right. But, you know, actually what's typically done in fluids, or at least in this particular situation, is we're going to substitute for, for u right here. Because we know from the previous page that u is ds dt, okay, right? And so let's substitute this in for acceleration, okay? And so if we do that, then we get that a is equal to d dt, or the derivative with respect to time of ds dt, okay? Oh, right. And so if we, uh, um, hang on. Sorry, sorry, I, uh, I kind of got mixed up. So we're, we're not going to sub, we're not going to kind of sub in for this. I got, I got mixed up with another part of my notes. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, and so what we're actually going to do is we're going to substitute in for this entire expression right here. Sorry for the, the confusion. I, I, was, I was thinking of, uh, of, of something else. But um, basically, the, we're, what we want to do is, is because uh, we want to express this in terms of, uh, of not with time, but we want to ex ex express this in terms of the uh, of the streamline coordinate s. Okay. Okay. And so we can do kind of a, uh, a chain rule from this, okay? And so what we can say is A is equal to du dt. Okay? And so this is equal to um, partial u, partial s, and also ds dt. And so what I did with there is I, I kind of just expanded the derivative. And so, you know, um, these two expressions here are the same because we have ds on the denominator here and then ds on the top right here. So these, these guys kind of cancel out, right? But what we know from the previous page is that ds dt, this is simply just u, okay? And so another way that we can express the acceleration is simply du ds times u. 
So I think this is kind of a, a strange way to express acceleration, but basically what it's saying is that another way we can express acceleration is the derivative of the velocity with respect to space. And so we're integrating, or we're uh, de deriving the velocity with, re with respect to the particle coordinate along the streamline. And then we're multiplying that by the velocity itself. Okay. And so if you actually, you know, um, compute the dimensions for this, uh, even though it's, you know, there's no time here, uh, what you'll see is that the dimensions for this are that of acceleration. Okay. Yeah. So I, I apologize for the confusion. I was uh, kind of thinking of, of something else. Right, so what this last part is saying is that even though this um, expression for acceleration looks a little bit strange, so we have two velocities and position, um, if you actually compute the dimensions for this and you work through kind of the, the same exercise that we did kind of at the first week of class, what you'll see is that this expression here has the same um, dimensions of acceleration, which is a length over time squared. Okay? It's because you have two velocities, um, and so that's a length, um, velocity times velocity is length squared over time squared, and then you divide that by s, which has dimensions of length, and you get length per time squared. So it's a strange, it's a strange way to express acceleration, but it's gonna serve us pretty well in, in the next step. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so sorry again for the confusion. Are, are there any uh, questions on this before we, we move on? Okay. Okay, um, and so our next step is that now we, that we have an expression for acceleration, we can actually sum up all the forces on a fluid particle. Okay? And then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to set that equal to the mass of the fluid particle multiplied by the acceleration. So we're going to take that acceleration and plug that into Newton's second law. And so, uh, you know, in order to help us sum up all the forces, we're going to draw a free body diagram. Okay. Right, so let's go ahead and do that. And so uh, I'm going to draw the fluid particle like a rectangle. Okay. Um, so again, use your, uh, use your uh, imagination. Okay. And so the length of this rectangle in this dimension is going to be delta S. And the length of the uh, of the rectangle in this direction will be delta n. Okay, and so the reason I, I use that notation is because this fluid particle is uh, is flowing along a streamline. Okay, and so the streamline is given by this um, you know uh, light blue line here. Okay, And so uh, the direction that's kind of parallel to the streamline, I'm going to give it um, that the, um, the uh, letter S, okay? And so the length of the fluid particle along the streamline will be delta S, and then the length of the fluid particle normal to the streamline will be delta N, okay? And then in addition to this, um, you know, this fluid particle is three dimensions, and so we'll give it a dimension delta Y, okay? And delta y will be the the um, the length of the of the particle into the page. Okay. 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 So we have a three-dimensional particle uh, with the particle going into the page, and that length is delta y. Okay, uh, and so let's talk about all the forces that are acting on this fluid particle, okay? And so first of all, this particle has a weight. Okay. And so the weight is gonna be, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've covered this before in buoyancy. It's gonna be the um, specific weight of the fluid 
And so since you know we just have one fluid here, I'm just going to use gamma. Okay. And this is going to be multiplied by the volume of the particle. So the volume here is uh, you know we have this box. So all we got, all we got to do is multiply by all the dimensions of the box. We have delta s, delta n, delta y. Okay. So this guy is volume. Okay. Okay. And so in addition to weight, we also have uh, pressure forces. Okay. Okay. And so just like we saw last week, you know, because a, a, a pressure develops in a, in a fluid, you know, this pressure is going to exert force. Okay. Okay. And so because um, you know, we have a moving fluid, what we're going to assume is that the pressure force on the, on the bottom side or the left side of the particle is gonna be different from the pressure force on the right. So I'm gonna denote them by P force one, and then the, uh, uh, on, the, on the right, we have P force two. Okay. Okay. And so the last thing that we're gonna consider is you know, if we have a pressure force, we need, we need to have a pressure. And so we're going to assume that the pressure at the, at the centroid of the particle is known. Okay? And so we can say that P, um, just P by itself, P with the ponytail, is pressure at centroid. Okay? Right. Um, and so basically, you know, this figure kind of has a lot going on, but basically, you know, the only forces that we're going to consider here are the weight of the particles. We have the, the weight in green, and then we have the pressure forces that are acting. One of it is kind of pushing the, the, the fluid along the streamline, so that's coming from the left, so that's P force one, and then coming from the right, which is opposing it, is P force two, okay? And so those are the three, um, the three forces that we're going to consider. And then before we start quantifying these, um, we need to um, characterize the direction of, of the particle, okay? And so we can, uh, we can basically assume that this um, fluid particle is going up and up and to the right, okay? Um, and then that, the angle with respect to the horizontal, it's gonna be given by theta, okay? Okay. And so we're almost out of time. So I think the last thing that I want to um, describe is I want to, um, you know, first quantify what the pressure force is going to be. Okay. And so we know that the pressure force um, from last week is going to be equal to the pressure multiplied by the area, right? And so let's characterize the pressure first. And so the pressure on this side, on this face of the uh, of the of the particle right here, okay, is going to be p minus uh, dp ds um, minus delta s over two, okay. And so you're probably wondering, you know, why don't we just use p because p is the pressure of the particle, right? And so because we have a moving fluid, the pressure is actually going to change all throughout the fluid, okay. And so what this quantity right here represents, this is the change in pressure. It's the change in pressure that occurs from moving from the centroid of the object to the left side of the of the particle. Okay, and so as we move from the centroid to the left, we move a distance delta s over two. Okay, and so in order to get the pressure difference, we multi we multiply the derivative of the pressure with respect to the streamline coordinate, so that's dp ds multiplied by the distance, which is delta s over two. And so we multiply this by the area. And so the area of that face is going to be delta n, delta y. Okay. Right. So that's the pressure force that's on the left side of the particle. Um, and then we can write a similar expression for the pressure force on the right. So that's going to be P force 2. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so we're all out of time. So are, are there any um, questions? So, you know, um, when we when we come back on Wednesday, we'll we'll pick up where we left off here and, and finish up the derivation. Uh, but are there any que last questions on this or just anything that we covered today?
yeah uh the top ds over two that's the uh distance um from the centroid right yes okay. yeah so that delta s over two that's the dis that's the uh distance from the centroid to the left face of the particle yeah so that that entire side has a length of delta s and so delta s over two will be the length from the centroid to that to that face yeah so delta y is given by uh by this guy right here so it's, it's the dimension of the of the particle that you can't see, right? So it, this is a three-dimensional object. And so delta Y is the distance uh, into the page. Yeah. So if you imagine like a three-dimensional box, that's the length um, going into the page. Yeah. So like you can just picture it as a circle with a dot in the center, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And would that be basically sitting on top of the centroid if we were to visualize it in 3D? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The centroid will be at the center of the particle. Okay. Yep. yep. So delta n is uh, is this is this length right here. So delta n is kind of the the length of the short side of the box. Yep. That you can see in, in the figure. Yep. So delta s, delta n, and delta y. Those are the dimensions of our fluid box that you can kind of think of it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So we're so we're out of time. So I I don't want to keep you guys. So uh, so thank you everyone for tuning in. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Um, and there's office hours after this. I'll be in there in a second. But you know, if you have any more questions, I'll, I'll stick around in here until until office hours begin. So uh, thank you, everybody. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thank you, Professor. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Professor, I had a quick question. Um, sure. It actually deals with the, the homework. Um, okay. It was.